Hey, Jeremy. Steve. What's going on, man? Not much. How's it going? Good. You ready to do some surfing? Yeah, but I don't see any sugar. Sugar? What are you talking about? Steve Ponder is going to talk about sugar surfing. Sure. Steve, we talked about this. We were going to meet here at the beach, do some actual surfing on the water first. Because, you know, Steve and Ponder's talking metaphorically about sugar surfing. Staying in the range, you know, avoiding the highs and lows, and surfing your sugar. You know, I can see you don't get it. So let's just go shred some waves. And then when, when we're done, we'll listen to Steve Ponder's session. Sound good? Bitchin'. Pit it, bro. So pit it. Oh, this wave has juice. I'm ready for sugar surfing. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Steve Ponder. I'm the author of Sugar Surfing, and I was invited to uh, present to you today in about half an hour or a little bit more uh, the basics of sugar surfing. I wrote the book in 2015, and I've given a number of talks on this. I am a person with type 1 diabetes since March 1st, 1966. I have a Joslyn Medal. Uh, I was the ADCES Diabetes Educator of the Year in 2018. Uh, I've been around the block a few times with diabetes, and I was honored to be asked to come back by Steve and Jeremy to be present again today uh, at this conference. So uh, let's not waste any time. Let's get right to it. I am, in a very short period of time, going to try to show you how to reach uh, a certain level of control, including 95% or around that time and range, the range being 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, try to get your uh, trend lines, average trend lines, looking something like this. Uh, get your average blood sugars down as low as you possibly uh, are comfortable taking them. And most of all, keeping the variation as represented by the standard deviation to a low number, in this case, 24 or uh, anything below 50 is certainly desirable. But uh, you should hopefully mo know more about this from other discussions you've heard already during this seminar. Uh, living with diabetes is like uh, living every day. It's all about choices. We make 35,000 choices each day as human beings. That amounts to about 12 million, almost 13 million a year. We make 225 choices about food every day. And I'm not talking about people with diabetes, just people in general. That's 82,000 choices we make uh, uh, every year about food. And again, this is just people without diabetes. Now, sugar surfing, as I define it, is also known as dynamic diabetes self-management. It's what I call trend pattern management in the moment. And that will become evident as you listen to the rest of this presentation. It combines mental shortcuts, also known as heuristics, actually visual mental shortcuts, and reflective thinking, as I'll explain uh, shortly. It's a cyclical process. And by cyclical, I'll show you this uh, diagram in pictures. The first step, of course, in sugar surfing is you have to see something. You have to glance. You have to look at your CGM trend line. This is what this is about. It's about CGM uh, trend line analysis. You have to see patterns, and I'll describe these patterns to you shortly. You have to make a decision about whether these are significant or not, and then you have to act on that. And action may be doing nothing, but simply uh, repeating the process of glancing a little bit later. So this is a cyclical event. Now, visualize sugar surfing, and I show you a 24-hour uh, continuous glucose monitoring trend line plot. Consider it as uh, a series of overlapping vignettes of variable lengths, such as that one, that one. And each one of these uh, boxes represents a point in time when I happen to look backwards towards that line. I obviously can't see what's in front of me because this is a historical um, uh, view, but I always am seeing what's behind me and where I'm headed. It's very important. Now back to a basic about sugar serving. Uh, points can define shapes. And this is uh, illustrated in my, my metaphor about what you see when you look up in the sky and you see constellations. Constellations many thousands of years ago were associated with animal shapes. Uh, you can also decide that a shape itself can carry some significance, not unlike that, like that oct octagonal um, uh, red sign, which we call a stop sign, or that triangular sign, which is a yield sign. So we can see immediate significance in a shape uh, if we're properly trained to recognize it. If we're in the medical field, we are, some of us are very comfortable at looking at uh, electrocardiograms and assigning significance to them, which can be actually vital to somebody's health and well-being. Let's go back to diabetes now. 
these are all blood glucose numbers arranged in columns. Uh, they're numbers and they're accurate data, but they're not very helpful unless you put them in a, in a format that you can use to interpret them. So I'm gonna do that for you right here. Now taking all those individual uh, glucose numbers and turning them into data points along a grid is what a CGM trend line does. And I highlight these with some colorful uh, diagrams or triangular and, and, and straight line shapes uh, to make a point, which I'll teach you just in a second and how to interpret these. But this is basically what you need to be able to read when you do sugar surfing. Now, when you're looking at your um, um, uh, CGM readout, whether it's on a receiver or whether it's on your phone, uh, many people just tend to focus on one thing and that's the number they see on the screen. It's almost like it's been a substitute for a meter. They may actually look at the trend arrow, but uh, one of the participants at a talk I gave a few years ago for TCOID uh, afterwards pointed out to me that she really didn't appreciate the value of the whole system being the data that's uh, present in the trend line. And that's really what sugar surfing focuses on. But before I go any further, I wanna make a point here. Uh, just like the surfer has to be balanced on that board as he, is, he or she is traveling uh, down that tube of water, it's important to remember the person with diabetes who receives basal insulin, as almost all of us do that have type 1 diabetes, need to have a steady basal insulin effect. Whether we're using a multi-dose insulin or even um, uh, uh, insulin pump uh, uh, delivered basal insulin. It's important because the job description for basal insulin is to balance the incoming glucose with the outgoing glucose. And the outgoing can be going to muscle tissue, uh, to, to organs, Incoming can be from actually from internal sources that, that are stored in the body, not to mention uh, uh, nutritional sources that we get from our intestinal tract as well. So when you're looking at your trend line, one of the very important things that I advocate, and I say this in the book, is, to, is every morning when you wake up, take, make sure you take a look back at how the night went. If you tend to have a steadily dropping blood sugar overnight, you may be running a little bit basal heavy, at least for that night. If this becomes a significant trend and every night you're dropping over time, then this may mean that your basal insulin is running a little bit too heavy, too rich. You may need to consider backing off. One other manifestation of that might be that you feel like you have to have a large snack at night to avoid getting low blood sugar during the night as well. If you find yourself into that uh, pattern, uh, it might be important for you to reassess your basal insulin, maybe reduce it in some way, maybe talk with your doctor if you feel more comfortable doing it that way, but you're always looking over your basal effect. And what you're trying to achieve over time is a, an effective neutrality, if you will, where your basal insulin is not going to let you do more than just drift, not drive you down or let you just go straight up uh, if it's insufficient or what I call basal light. The point of basal insulin is very simple. It's really meant to keep you steady. It's not meant to really consistently raise or lower your blood sugar levels. The lone exception to that are those of you that use specialized hybrid closed loop insulin pumps now, who actually, which actually adjust the basal insulin uh, to slowly steer blood sugar levels. I'm going to exclude that in my discussion here, but basal insulins are best kept balanced and steady, not too heavy, uh, not too light but just to keep things steady. And as you can see here, even though this one's outside the range, it's actually fairly steady. So the basal insulin in this situation is not uh, inappropriate, quite frankly. It would require some action to bring that level down, of course, but that's in a different part of the discussion. Now, what, could, what are some of the things that can suddenly change your basal insulin needs? Well, these are just, there are many of them and they can occur alone or in combination. Growth, weight loss or weight changes, um, age, duration of your diabetes, hormonal cycles, certain medications, illness and stress, uh, exercise, changes in your fitness and activity level, or just uh, changes in your daily activity, uh, weekdays to weekends. Numerous things can change basal insulin needs. So it's important to always keep an eye on your basal insulin. Back to sugar serving now. This is the process in, 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 a, in a nice circular uh, diagram uh, about what sugar serving is about. It's about seeing patterns. I'll show you these patterns shortly. It's understanding their significance. It's responding appropriately to them and then following up carefully. Again, a cyclical process. These are the anatomical features that you will see on a CGM trend line, on a continuous glucose monitoring trend line. And I define them in, with these basic six terms. There is a period of stability called a shelf. 
I assign a width to that of about 30 milligrams per deciliter or two millimoles if you're using uh, European or other uh, metric uh, units. Uh, a delta wave is a rise in blood glucose of at least 30 points or two millimeters over a one hour period of time. Now I use one hour as a basic measure, of, a unit of measure, but it can be shorter or longer and I'll describe that shortly. The same thing occurs with a reduction or a drop. Uh, of at least 30 points uh, uh, over a period of uh, around one hour. But again, these are basic units of measure, not unlike a meter is a unit of measure, a kilometer, a millimeter. So it's just the core unit of measure. So don't take the one hour literally, and you'll see examples of that shortly. A change in direction of the trend line uh, uh, from going upward to downward, a full directional change, is what I call a pivot. It can also be a downward change that reverses back upward. These are usually these usually are, occur under the influence of either insulin or carbohydrates, plus or minus exercise in regards to dropping something or turning one around, plus or minus stress in regards to dropping a uh, dropping blood sugar going back up. Uh, although stress and exercise can have uh, uh, effects seemingly in either direction, an inflection is simply a change in the direction of a steady trend, a relatively steady trending uh, uh, line. And you can see two examples of this. One is uh, the period of time between when an insulin dose is given and when a bend or a reduction in, in the blood glucose is seen. And that also defines a, a period of time called a lag, which is the period of time between when the action is taken and when the actual uh, visualization of the change in blood glucose levels is, is uh, was seen on the trend line. Uh, the same applies on an upwards inflection here. Uh, and this in this case could be under the influence of a carbohydrate dose. Again, both insulin and carbohydrates do have uh, potentially lag times, which can be visualized on the CGM trend line. So these are your core features that you're going to see on any trend line. They just repeat over and over and over again, like notes on a musical score. Sugar surfing, to remind everybody, isn't about controlling everything. It's actually learning how to manage change as it happens in the moment. And I make a point with this with my patients that I don't control diabetes. I don't control my own diabetes. I don't uh, control anybody else's. In fact, I don't manage anybody else's. That's only for you to do. I don't control the weather, uh, but I manage how I live in and out uh, of the different environmental circumstances. So management and control in my mind are different concepts. Sugar surfing is about managing the moment. It's also a point of view, if you will, uh, it's important if you are a sugar server <clears throat> that you don't judge yourself too harshly on what uh, what happens. Uh, you're always trying to get better, trying to work and get experienced. No one is perfect, certainly not me. Uh, you have to work each situation as it comes at you. Diabetes care is a skill set. It's not something that anybody can dispense to you. Uh, and as I said before, control really you know exists in the moment. Uh, it's really managing in the moment is what I like to consider it more so than control. And then again, control, if you want to use that term, is actually the result of all your decisions and choices. And you make thousands of them every day, as I pointed out earlier. And as I mentioned earlier, no healthcare provider manages anybody's diabetes. It's very important to remember that you manage your diabetes. This picture quickly made you think that doesn't look right. And your brain processed it and realized it was really uh, just an optical illusion simply by uh, rotating the picture in a, in a, in a 90 degree fashion. So images force you to think. Uh, that's why I have so many images on this slide set. Um, the three dimensions of sugar surfing I'm gonna show you and emphasize are the interpretation and the recognition of drifts. I also call those shelves, delta waves, upward changes in blood glucose, which are considered significant, and drops or downward changes in blood sugar that are considered significant as well. Now the significance depends on you, the patient, and what you happen to be doing at the time you see uh, this pattern. For example, I give three examples of three very different range, different ranges of exactly the same patterns uh, uh, in the in the preceding one hour. Each one of those could result in a totally different interpretation about whether something is significant or not. The same thing applies with these uh, uh, upward delta waves. For example, moving upward from 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter might consider, be considered a positive thing if you're recovering from a mild low blood sugar that you've just treated. On the other hand, Moving upward from 190 to 220 with exactly the same delta wave uh, may interpret a, may result in a different interpretation altogether, resulting in perhaps some action taken to try to bring the blood sugar down. Delta waves, as I said earlier, and drops and shelves can come in different lengths of time. And so as I put in these one hour uh, gradations on this grid, you can see 
uh, at different points along the timeline, significance may occur. For example, this may not be terribly significant at this point, yet might become more significant uh, later on. Just like this line here, this, uh, this delta wave here early on may not be that significant, but might get significant uh, after a few more hours. So time will modify the interpretation of significance in these situations. A drop, again, uh, it requires a certain level of interpretation, uh, a 220 to 190 uh, and a, a 100 to 70 with exactly the same patterns uh, would elicit totally different responses. The lower one would probably result in some treatment for an impending low blood sugar or some change in some behavior. Whereas the, the one on the top may require nothing more than just careful close observation without any further action. So just remember um, where, where you are, when, what is going on when you see these patterns will dictate what actions are, are, are performed. Now, how you, I have a short uh, acronym here for how you determine whether some, something is significant. You may have your own way of doing this, but I always like to think of what am I doing right now? My current activity, I call it care, take care. Anticipated, what am I thinking about doing? What's my anticipated action? Because I can change that. If I was planning on doing something, but the trend line suggests I should do something else, I may postpone that action and do something else instead. Recent, what are my recent activities? What did I just do in the last one or two hours that might be influencing this pattern right now? And the experience, is this something that, is this something that happens with a lot of uh, repetition? And I most likely will remember that, even though I may not remember the specifics of each situation. So I take care, and this actually takes longer to explain than it does to actually do, as you might imagine. Now, each one of these are examples of trend lines in this cartoon here, uh, which at, depending on when I happen to look, if I put an X there, that trend line is pushing just under 180 if I look at it right here. So I'd have to make a decision if I'm going to act on that. Likewise, if I'm up here and it's trending upward already and it's well above 180, say 220, I'm probably going to make even a more aggressive decision than I would if it was down here. And so you can see at any point along these uh, curves, the point in time when I happen to look at them and the actions that I'm performing at that point in time are going to influence my subsequent actions. Very, very important. So viewing the trend line is essential. Here are three concrete examples of that. Waiting for a high blood sugar to come down following an insulin dose, which might take a considerable amount of time and on the fall or the drop, uh, then consume the meal, even though it may be still be in the higher range, as opposed to eating the meal right after the, the insulin dose was given. Likewise, in the when I'm in an in-range setting between 70 and 180, I, may, I would certainly probably wait less time after an insulin dose and when the bend in the line occurred and when I would eat my meal. Again, it might be dependent upon what type of meal or what kind of carbohydrate source, if any, I'm consuming. On the bottom, you might actually ing ingest or eat the meal uh, because you're in a low range and wait for the blood sugar to start trending up before you dose the insulin. So these are all situational uh, examples where timing and location make a tremendous, have a tremendous impact on what your subsequent actions are, are, are going to be. Also remember that in my, I paraphrase uh, uh, an old uh, uh, quote here, no one ever steps into the same river twice for it's not the same river and then not the same person. But just look at this example here in, in my case, when I had essentially the same blood glucose levels several hours apart, yet I took the same insulin dose, same amount here, yet I got different outcomes. Uh, this is what we used to see in the old days when all we checked was single point in time blood glucose levels and responded to those and would often see very inconsistent or uh, uh, you know, uh, paradoxical responses. Just remember, you are managing a moment. And in this first case, you can see there was a general upward trend going on, whereas there was a more steady trend here. So not surprisingly, I was going to see a different outcome. Remember, and I keep emphasizing this in this talk, you have to start glancing before you can see patterns, before you can assign any significance or decide whether or not to act. Now, while you might glance at a reading, it could be you're just curious, like Curious George here. You, could, you might start feeling like your blood sugar is dropping or feel like you're high or something's changing. And that would be a, uh, an impetus to, to glance at your trend line or simply the situation. You're about to have a stack of pancakes with a lot of syrup and you really want to know what's going on before you do something like that. So there are all sorts of reasons for glancing. This is just this is a bit of a busy slide. I'm just going to highlight the point here of this study was that the more times that a person glances at their CGM trend line, the lower the A1C per day, the fewer the highs, the more time and range, 
fewer the lows below 70, fewer the fewer severe lows below 55, and fewer extreme lows before below 45. Extremely important to recognize. Glancing is the first step you have to do. Now, getting back to shape recognition, now you should practice this on your own and, and pull up some of your own pattern and just look at them. Now, when you see this, this is a 24 hour plot. So there's a lot of data crammed in here, but how many shapes can you quickly identify? I'm gonna show, show you for time's sake. If you can see, I'm highlighting now all the diagram, all the, all the images, except for the lags uh, that I described earlier in the pattern anatomy. And what you'll see here are five drops, one, two, three, four, five, two shelves here and here, five delta waves, one, two, three, four, five, two, or th two of these are rather small, five inflections, and these are just changes or bends, uh, as you can see here, one, two, um, uh, three, four, five, and then seven pivots or complete reversals in direction. Now notice the lines don't have to be perfectly straight. And you're looking at, the, at looking back at these more retrospectively than, than in the moment. So just remember, these are general tr tr downward trending directions, even though they may look a little sawtooth in each case. You have to be able to look past that when you're looking at these trend lines. Not everything is a nice, straight, pure uh, line. Now, glancing is important. And I put these little eye symbols here just to highlight. As I show you this image over a six-hour period, really what I'm seeing at each point in time when these decisions are made are when that eyeball is present right here, right here, right here. And notice that that first view, things are going steady. I'm on a shelf. I've had a dose of, uh, of insulin. I waited and had a meal and I'm steady. Nothing, no action needed. I want, I glanced, but no action. In, in significance was just watch. Uh, a little bit later, about an hour or so later, same thing, looks pretty steady. After that, however, uh, the line started to trend up. And so you see the beginnings of a delta wave. It was decided at that point that this was significant at that particular value, so a dose of insulin was taken. There's a lag time here, as you can see, about 30 minutes, and then an inflection to a shelf, which then inflected down again, but not until this happened, because I was a bit concerned that this had not pivoted, which is what my intent was. It was to pivot this line. It just turned into a shelf. So I took another small, a larger, slightly larger dose, re uh, resulting in a bit of a lag time, and then a, a drop, as I call it, uh, which then came on down. Uh, it was accompanied by a five mile walk with a couple of five gram uh, carbohydrate snacks during the walk to, to slow down the drop and to level things out into a nice shelf again. And each point along the way, I, I, when I looked back, I saw what was going on right behind me and I made that, use that to make a decision about what my next action would be, which would be to either do nothing or to do something. And later on, well after the walk was over, I noticed I was nice and steady. So over a six hour period, I glanced about six times, uh, roughly about once an hour uh, in that particular afternoon. So the glancing checklist comes down to this. When you look at this, you have to decide where am I? How high is my blood sugar? What direction is it moving? And how fast is it changing? What have I done recently? Not what I did yesterday necessarily, but what have I done just most recently? What am I about to consider doing? Uh, and I can certainly change my mind based on what the trend line is telling me. I might make an adjustment. What has experience taught me? Do I need to act now? Yes or no. Or do I just need to wait and watch uh, carefully? And you have to choose your actions and then decide to, what you're going to do and then carry on, which is basically glancing later. Now, there are four basic surfing moves I want to show you. There's the down pivot, the up pivot, the drop, and the nudge. Very important concepts here. And these are the things you actually attempt to do and try to do uh, through your deliberate actions in sugar surfing. Now, real quickly, what move that of the four I just described you see here? A steady trend line, a dose of insulin, uh, an inflection, a reduction, and an inflection back to a straight line. That is called taking the drop. That is a drop. It's actually uh, using a small amount of insulin. You might, Some of you might consider that a microbolus, which we'll talk about later. Let's talk about what these are real quickly. What are these structures? Now, I'm hoping you can start seeing these and you start practicing looking for them. There are four, uh, four drops. There are a number of shelves, and I mean, uh, delta waves here. There are a couple of four delta waves. Uh, I highlight what I would consider some about four shelves, four or five shelves. And then of course, there are a number of inflections if you really wanna get down and drill down on these. Um, and then you see three pivots, okay? Look for these people. These are very, very important. Once you can see these, you know you have the, the vocabulary of how to sugar serve. 
Now, microdosing is something we talk about at length in the book and, and, and on the website, sugarsurfing.com. That's exploring how many, uh, you have to be able to explore how, how much a small amount of carbohydrate, fast acting carbohydrate, and a small amount of rapid acting insulin dose uh, will affect your trend line. You have to practice this over time. It's not something I can assign you or give you a formula for. Generally, you'll start with small amounts of carbohydrates and, and, and insulin. Uh, that could even be something as small as uh, four grams, uh, five grams of carbohydrates, as, you, as you've seen me do, and certainly small doses of insulin. A half a unit or a unit obviously depends on your situation as, as to what you consider small. Uh, it, uh, small for some people, maybe five units. Uh, but you have to start with your smallest units and see how, what they will do to influence a trend line. And you have to practice that over and over and over again. And then you have to create a comfortable range of these, of these uh, carbs and or insulin and these sources of carbs that you can use to choose from, from for given situations. And then once you have a stable range of carb and insulin doses to choose from, you can start subtracting and adding more based on the rate of change of the trend line. In other words, you can take a little spin off if you if you're if you're dropping too hot, uh, dropping too fast, or put more spin on if you're increasing too much. Uh, to use a, a, a tennis metaphor. Practical points here to, to remember: each glance, every each time you glance, you might change your interpretation of what you thought before. You may either affirm what you saw before, or you may say, "No, I didn't have that right. It, it's changing." Basic shapes that I've shown you will morph and shift into new ones. That's just normal. That's just the, the normal uh, way things work. Train your eye to see these basic shapes very quickly and appreciate lag times between when you do an action and how long it takes to, for that action to occur. Remember, it can take 15, 20, 30 minutes sometimes for certain things to kick in, sometimes shorter, sometimes a lot longer. If you use the event markers on your CGM, that can be a big help in terms of knowing when you did something because you might forget. It takes a, little, a few extra seconds to do that, to put the event markers on your CGM, but it's time well spent in my opinion. Always be conservative when you're first learning to sugar surf. Use small, make small moves. Uh, don't try to make any major big dosing adjustments or carb intake uh, changes to, to influence the trend line. Be very, very patient. Learn to read the trend line. That's probably the most important thing you have to do first. That's dynamic diabetes management. Now, here's an example of this glancing. Again, here I see a shelf. Here I see a shelf that merged into a drop. You notice those are associated with, uh, with meals, associated with these little icons here and a dose of insulin. I'm not giving you the exact amount. I'm just showing you how, we, how I see the lines. A, delta, a small little delta wave occurred at this glance at which inflected into a shelf. I looked over here, and now that shelf had inflected into a delta wave. I looked over here, and that delta wave continued. Now, it was after I'd even given a dose of insulin to try to slow that delta wave down. So in the absence of any change, I took an, a, another dose. It had been about an hour or so, so I figured that first dose was insufficient. And I finally was able to get a pivot, a small pivot off of that, which turned into a drop, as you can see here. And then further on, the drop continues. And as I continue on in this next set of slides, which continues this uh, picture out, that drop eventually inflected into uh, a shelf. So just glance, watch. A lot of times I did nothing but watch. Sometimes I made a decision to act. But in every situation, I was aware of what was going on. And of course, glance an hour or so later and still standing, uh, trending straight. That's sugar surfing, folks. Now, this point is to sh this, these images will show you these are nine different days. No two days are ever alike. For me, at least, they're not alike. Uh, I have a, a very uh, a highly varied life, lots of crazy schedules. Uh, I would dare say that every one of you have exactly the same kind of life I do. Remember, sugar serving is based on a premise that you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to serve. You can learn to manage these waves. The concepts you need to embrace are you have to be able to recognize these patterns, assign significance to them. You're managing a situation, not just blood sugar, food, and insulin, but a situation. That's important to remember. You can preempt or prevent things from happening as they are occurring. And you can also learn how to overlap insulin dosages, not stack them, overlap them. I call it eye chaining. And that's a skill that's for more advanced sugar surfers. Remember that your insulin and food action are not constants. You're just expecting a general response. That's what you're hoping for. And that's what you hope to see when you look at the trend line. Many, many, many things can change the impact. So that's why you have to glance. You are steering a trend, not just reacting to a number. And remember, sugar surfing blends style, in other words, how you do something with substance, in other words, what you do. Style and substance uh, come together in, in, in sugar surfing. 
This slide is just to show you that what we're aiming for with sugar syruping or any sort of, uh, of optimal control uh, methodology is to achieve as much time and range as possible. The, all these people have the same A1C of 7%, yet you see which one you'd rather be. Somebody to the right of the center is what you'd rather have in regards to your time and range for your blood sugar levels, as opposed to having 40% high, 20% low, and 40% in range, and still have a 7% A1C. So A1Cs don't tell that much anymore uh, in the era of the CGM. Keep glancing. I keep repeating this because it's important. Try to see about one hour ahead when you glance. Try to think where will I think I'll be in an hour based on where I'm, where I'm heading, where I'm at right now, which direction I'm going. But always be remember, anchored in the present, of course. Don't forget your insulin wears off, your food wears off. You have to be able to learn, turn, turn, learn the difference between the two of these things. Inflections often tell that story. When the line bends, when the insulin wears off or the, when the food kicks in or both. Trend line significance, again, is always defined in the moment. Rapid acting insulin effects can be overlapped, and that's what I mentioned earlier. I call them chain-dependent insulin event management. I call it also eye chaining. Stress and chaos happen to every one of us. They're like glycemic grip currents, as I write in the book. Here's a concrete example of sugar serving. Um, wake up, I wake up about 4.30 in the morning in this case. I look back and I see that big delta wave. I instantly see that, I interpret that, I saw that inflection there. I decided to take an insulin dose. I'm, I won't tell you how much, but I took a dose. There was a lag time, as you can see here, there was a pivot and a drop. Uh, I was already up by six o'clock. Uh, this, when this inflection occurred around 6.30 or so, uh, nothing was done to stop that. This basically, in, in essence, represented the effective insulin duration from that injection. I'm not saying there's not insulin still in my system, but the effective duration of that insulin, which is what matters to me at this point, uh, was approximately roughly two hours in this situation. I dare say the insulin effect may have lasted a little bit longer, but it faded, but the bulk of the insulin effect occurred in that two hour period, as you can see here, okay? So these are three situations that I was managing. The first one was when I woke up, the second one was after I gave the dose and I followed through by, and I was glancing throughout this period because I was getting up, getting ready for the day. And the third one was after I'd studied out, I'd, I'd reached the steady state and it was on a shelf. Now this is a pizza and I know everybody likes to know how to serve different carby foods. And I am not promoting carbohydrate excess at all. Uh, I tend to eat a lower carb uh, 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 eating approach myself, but sugar serving a pizza is something people you know, ask me about all the time. In this case, I, it illustrates some key concepts. First of all, I had a, um, I came in on a nice steady shelf here about three o'clock in the afternoon. I decided to eat about what I thought was 66 grams of pizza. I took roughly six units for that. Um, over two hours, uh, that pizza, it's a, of course, it's gonna be slow for me, a slow carb in my, in my book. Uh, it ultimately dipped my blood sugar down, but then didn't go too far, but and nothing was done to make this go up. But then it started to inflect back up. I interpreted that as a waning of my insulin that I took here, the six units. That was starting to wear off here. And so as that delta wave occurred, I took a secondary dose, lower than the first one, to offset that rise. Now, what's paradoxical is I took it at a blood sugar of 113, which nobody would ever do right before the era of sugar serving. And in doing so, I was able to cause a pivot to occur over the next 30 minutes that peaked no higher than 144 and came on back down and inflected back into a steady trend line. So those 66 grams of pizza took 10 units uh, spaced out over roughly two hours uh, with careful watching. Um, to, to, to process. It's not just one and done, like many of us uh, have been taught to think, take a dose of insulin, eat, and don't worry about it after that. And so the second situation was, my, was watching that, that time period after the pizza and taking that secondary dose of insulin, then I was back where I wanted to be uh, about four hours later. Again, situational management is what sugar serving is about. In this case, my first point of view, I see this slight delta wave occurring at above 140, which was significant to me. I decided to take a dose of insulin, which did nothing more that caused it to uh, result in a shell for a period of stability, yet hovering above 140. And a couple of hours later, you can start to drift up more. At that point, I decided to take a dose of insulin here. Now, this was waking up in the morning. And so I used that insulin dose. I coupled it with, with uh, waiting a little bit longer for the drop to occur. Then I had my, my actually my a small breakfast about an hour, uh, a little bit of an hour later. So I was able to manipulate things to uh, steer this line back into a steady trend line, uh, by not just by taking a correction, but a correction for and uh, a dose for a meal as well. Kind of creative thinking here. 
Okay, so that's the second situation, and that's the next situation, and that's the, the final situation. But at each point, I have a point of view, and I have to make a decision based on what, what I'm, how I'm going to manage that situation. Timing is everything, folks. Very important to remember. Um, oh, crap, was that today? You need to get that. Usually speaking, you need to get that insulin on board before the meal. There are exceptions, as many of you know, largely because we want to minimize the excursion on our blood sugars after meals. Keep in mind that at an A1C of 7.3% or less, 70% of your A1C is contributed to by what happens to your blood sugar after the meal. Very important to remember that. What we're trying to do is balance food and insulin so there's minimum excursion in the trend line afterwards. And inset, uh, insulin onset times, as you can see in this example, just to show you, will vary. What I look for is I look for the bend. I write about that in the book, waiting for the bend. That's a visual interpretation that, uh, of the lag time between when an insulin is given, dose is given and when I see a, a reduction in the blood sugar level. Now, this is, an, this is a useful application of that. Um, bolus insulin, for, this is a long-acting carbohydrate meal right here on top, and it just shows you the blood sugar raising effect of it. This shows you the effect of the bolus insulin I took for it using multi-dose insulin. This is MDI. And um, uh, as this insulin dose peaks and goes down, this food is still working, hence the blood sugar level tends to start going up. So I overlap at second dose, and this is eye chaining, a uh, visual interpretation of eye chaining. I take a second dose of insulin to cover the latter half of that meal. And in doing so, I bring the blood sugar back down. That's eye chaining, if you want to. Or it's also called preempting or preventing something from happening. Um, eye chaining is based on your effective duration of insulin action, knowing how long your insulin usually lasts. In my case, it's one and a half to two hours, two and a half hours. And once I start seeing that effect wade, wane, I, I am more likely to get a secondary dose. And so I'm trying to preempt a secondary rise in blood sugar based on a long acting meal. Uh, and usually my follow-up insulin doses are usually smaller or step down compared to the first. Eye chains are like a relay race. You, you, again, you have to know when your first insulin dose is starting to to fade away and when to start another one. And looking for inflections can be very helpful in that. And be mindful that you don't have an overly heavy basal rate running in the background. Also consider the type and amount of the meal you're eating too, whether that's a pizza or a pasta or something. And eye chaining is not a beginner move, very important. Now, if you're using a pump, you can actually program the pump to give all that insulin over a defined period of time. That's called the dual weight bolus. Um, I won't spend much time on that here. This is in the book, an example of how I used, how I did this. Uh, uh, this is the breakfast cereal challenge. Uh, and I, I wrote about this uh, uh, five years ago. It, I, Honey Nut Cheerios is what I did. And I measured out the same amount three days in a row. I started out with roughly the same blood sugar. The first day I took seven units of uh, apedra, what I had in the pump at the time, for 56 grams of carbohydrates, sugar, uh, that's cereal and milk. Notice I had a quick delta wave that occurred. I did wait for the bend to occur after the dose. I took a preemptive dose to prevent that from happening, which actually just resulted in a shelf. And I took a drop dose to bring it back down. I was running a steady basal rate in the background of 0.65 units per hour. The next day, I took the results from the previous day. I combined the seven and the five, those two do doses I, uh, that I took uh, in response to that meal earlier, I took it as 12. Seems like a lot, but actually, it, it, well, it look what happened. Uh, that 56 grams of carbohydrates uh, resulted in a fairly fairly steady line, but which then had a late rise, which I then went back and took that five units of epidra uh, to take another drop and do that again and, and bring that back down into range. Third day, I I combine I use that 12 units up front, but now I program that five units into my pump to be given over three hours. Notice I maintained everything in range as a result of that. So again, this is an example of sequential learning based on your own results. Eye chaining tips. Again, I've shown you this before. As you see this rise occurring at the end of your effective insulin duration, you can consider taking an additional dose. If you have a long acting carbohydrate meal, this results in a pivot. And that usually was enough. I usually require two, maybe three uh, uh, staggered dosages or eye change dosages to car carry, uh, cover some of the uh, big uh, carbohydrate meals. I sometimes eat. I'm not a big carb eater, like I said earlier. Another example of a three dose meal, uh, if I didn't act at this point, after I took this eight units here, I took a four unit to deflect that. It actually, actually didn't pivot it. It just turned it into a shelf. And so I could have left it there and let it just go straight to the night at around 140. But I chose consciously to take a dose of 3.5 units and take the drop, as you see there, and bring it back in range. So dosing on deltas. I have a blog on the sugarserving.com website that it describes this in great detail. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can learn how to dose on deltas. 
once you get good at this, here are some examples. Pizza Hut, got that mastered. In and out Burgers, um, also. Practice makes perfect. Uh, once you find the right sequence of events to do, I had to do a couple of uh, micro carbs here and here, but I kept a nice steady in range trend line. This was a new food I'd consumed when I was in uh, Atlanta for a conference. And again, I watched the trend line. I took a dose of insulin, what I thought was uh, in this particular manicotti meal, which I thought was 75 grams. It was at a restaurant. After the duration of insulin action faded and this line started to go up, that's when I decided to take another dose. And so I was preempting at a fairly low level of 91 and notice it came up and leveled off. So anticipatory preemptive uh, dosing um, uh, can be very powerful once you're experienced at doing it. I don't want to dismiss exercise and sugar surfing. I do it all the time. I take five mile walks almost every day and I have to sugar surf on them as well. Sometimes I take uh, long acting carbohydrates with me, sometimes fast acting carbohydrates, uh, but I will watch the trend line during my walk and manipulate up or down based on uh, 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 my state of uh, uh, wellness, health, uh, activity level, whether I'm, gonna, whether I'm gonna run or whether I'm just going to walk as well. Microdosing when it works uh, the way you want it to uh, is, is a beautiful thing. Uh, you can take small dosages just to barely nudge the line back, uh, back down. This is an insulin uh, microdose. Major takeaways here for surfing, and I know I've tried to do this very quickly for you guys. Sugar surfing is a process. It allows for situational management. That's what CGMs allow us to do. Always start with your prescribed management. I'm not going to ask you to deviate from whatever your specialist has told you to do, but try to use that first and see if it works. It may be a nice starting point in regards to the doses you would take for certain situations. Always, always, always make sure you have a steady basal effect. Don't run basal heavy. Don't run basal light. I have blogs on the sugarserving.com website about basal neutrality. Please, I refer you to them. Learn the different effects of food, insulin, stress, and exercise. I have a chapter in the book I call the, the top 10 list, which is uh, identifying those frequently consumed foods and what their glycemic, glycemic effects are. And once you master those, it makes you more comfortable uh, making forays out into different food types because you can equate them to some of the things you may have eaten in the past. Sugarserving.com is a great site, lots of educational material there, all free. I run a nonprofit, donations accepted. Um, anybody that has been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in the last three months, for the last four or five years, has been allowed, able to get a free ebook. All you have to do is go to the website and request it. Finally, some final sugar surfing tips. Make sure you strategically glance at that trend line 15 to 20 times a day. I've said this eight times, I think, during this talk. It's important. Check for those core patterns and start learning how to pick them up uh, visually. Decide for yourself when a trend line is significant to you when it requires your attention. Synchronize your insulin doses in your meal and food types and the trending direction to the best of your ability and keep practicing. Master the art of microdosing insulin and or carbs to maximize that time and range. That is between 70 and 180 milligrams per deciliter. And learn from your actions. Success is a cheerleader. Failure is your teacher. I want to thank uh, Steve uh, and Jeremy and the TCOYD team, I get my tongue tied here, uh, for the wonderful opportunity to present Sugar Surfing again to you. I did my best to get this across in a little over half an hour. Hopefully the editors will condense it down and make it uh, presentable. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. And please uh, send any inquiries or emails to admin at sugarsurfing.com or order a print book if you like off of sugar surfing at sugarsurfing.com. Thank you very much.